right then, Dave, just let us know when we're live. That on silent when live. Yeah, I put this on silent. I'm not actually sure. <laughs> it is, I think it's got a strap through there. Okay. Oh. Okay, folks, welcome. Maybe just click the side buttons there. Yeah, there you go. Folks, welcome to Mala Mala. Um, we are currently sitting with Gareth Nuttlesmith, who's in frame now. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, with Guy Balm. Afternoon, everyone. And with Nikki. Nikki, I've forgotten your... Well, I don't think I've got your surname yet. LaRue. Hi, everyone. Nikki LaRue. Okay, so Guy and Nikki, and we're just overlooking the sand river here. We are currently at Kiklezi Hash Breakfast Spot. It's a very beautiful area. It's a lovely day here at Mala Mala might um, we need you guys help it is a bit windy today i know there's a cold front that's hit cape town and i think this is the warm front for the cold front and it's a little bit windy here so we just need you guys to tell us if um the audio is good or bad or otherwise but what we're going to be talking about today is um carnivores and we're going to be talking about carnivores because Panthera has been doing research in this area for quite some time and Guy is going to tell us Guy, you know what, excuse me folks, I'm just going to get a little bit more comfortable because this <laughs> I don't want to be sitting like this for too long Yeah <laughs> Fall off the vehicle <laughs> Yeah Okay So Guy, maybe in the, in the meantime, while I'm doing this if you want to start talking about what Panthera is, first of all what Panthera does Sure. So, Panthera is a we are a, a charity. Uh, uh, sheesh, here I am looking at myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold on a second, folks. We will get this right at some point. Biologists and technology don't yeah. typically gel. Yeah. So there you go. They know this already. <laughs> okay. So that's much better now. Okay. Just a step back, Gareth, and then you'll be fine. Yeah, I, I just need to leave this photo alone as you guys do it, eh? Okay, so let's try that again. Tell us a bit about Panthera. So, so Panthera is a, it's a, a, a charity which is headquartered in New York um, that funds overseas and implements projects, conservation projects on, on cats all over the world. So we, we work on, on tigers and snow leopards in Asia, um, on... Uh, jaguars and mountain lions in the Americas and then here in Africa on, on lions, cheetahs and, and leopards and, and most of my focus is on leopards. I, I direct Panthera's leopard program. Uh, this, this keeps me busy. Um, leopards have a, uh, have a vast geographic distribution so they found from the southern tip of Africa across most of the African continent into the Middle East and across much of Asia so we have we have projects across that entire uh, range and, um, and and most of it uh, focused on on applied conservation on, on trying to protect leopards and trying to uh, improve their status um, but we also we we, we are um, Panthera is, is, is founded by our scientists and we, we, we always want to underpin our work on on, on strong science and, and and that requires understanding and knowing about the species that we were looking to protect and hence studies like we have here on Mala Mala and, and, and some of the adjoining reserves trying to, to get to grips with uh, those aspects of leopard biology, leopard um, ecology um, that, that can help inform their management and conservation uh, in, in other parts of, of, of the world where they are, are far less protected as they are here at Mala Mala. So Guy, you've been doing research in this area for how long now? How long has Panthera been in the Sabi Sands? And sure. So, so we've been collaborating um, with the different lodges here, with, with Mala Mala and, 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 and many of the other lodges in the, the Sabi Sands and in the, the Sabi Game Reserve, probably for about 10 years now. Um, 
I, I, I started working on leopards almost 20 years ago now um, in, in another part of South Africa. This is in, uh, in, in northern KwaZulu Natal. It's another protected area called, called Linda Private Game Reserve. And we ran a 10 year study there and we, we learned a great deal about leopards. But I, I realized that, that 10 years, even that, is just a very brief window on, on the life of a, a long lived species like leopards. They can live up to 18, 19 years. And, and, and to really know a species, you need to study multiple generations. And um, thankfully, I had always known about these very relaxed leopards here at, the Ma in, at Mala Mala. I, um, a family of mine um, have, a, have a lodge just next door. And so I've been coming here since I was about two months old. And, uh, and so I knew about these incredibly habituated cats and, and more importantly, how the guides had been documenting the lives of these animals over the years. So, so yeah, in, in, a, in 2009, I started reaching out to, to, the, to guides um, that had been working in this area for the last 30, 40 years. And starting to reconstruct the, the sort of the lineages, the, the histories of these of these different cats, and um, and so even though the, the project's only been going for ten years, we have data going back to the late seventies. So so over um, oh, forty years of demographic data uh, on, on more than I think it's about eight hundred and fifty known leopards, and then we've been able to reconstruct their life histories when they were born, how many cubs they produced, when they died, why they what what killed them. Um, and, and that is that's been pivotal to to us being able to understand what drives leopard lep populations in, in natural situations like this. I'm just gonna just for a second here. I just want to find out from anybody listening here. So you've got a few people in the chat room. Uh, why don't any of you guys just tell us what the audio is like coming through there? Uh, we just want to check that we're okay, um, and then we'll continue. Uh, so you mentioned that you've been working with guides a bit, and I also just want to mention if you have any questions. Uh, I know a lot of you do follow uh, our cats here at Mala Mala and elsewhere. Um, please feel free to ask. Um, guy, what's it been like? You know, you say you started to work more with guides, and this is Gareth here. Uh, Gareth's job here at Mala Mala is not only as a ranger or guide. Uh, Gareth has been the contact for Guy in on our property at least and has been helping Guy with the research. Maybe Gareth, if you want to just fill in from a guide's perspective what that entails. So, as well. yeah. so we enter, or we've been recording our sightings of Mala Mala for decades now, and then there's always a ranger who enters that data from our data book into the Panthera system so that. That is all digitized and is made available to Panthera through uh, their system. And that's basically what I do each month as I go through the sightings and enter the sightings into their system. And that just is nice to have that online. And then I know you looked at our historical data um, because we've been keeping these, these records since the late 80s until now, so that's quite a good data set from Mala Mala itself and I know that the rangers have always kept that data it's identifying the leopards on game drive recording that position um, with what Panthera are trying to do here establishing individuals and then the life histories of different lineages so from a ranger point of view it's it's quite nice because most of us are photographically inclined so we get photographic um, well, photos which are, can be quite useful in identifying individuals and keeping records of individuals quite regularly for our game viewing purposes but also then being able to use that for a scientific point of view and getting a better understanding of the ecology and from Panthera we work together individuals when they do camera trap surveys from what we have in the site data is quite important so just um, to clarify there, when Garrett talks about the sightings data, we fill in the data book that or the data book you're talking about is uh, what we call the game report book. And I think it's been filled in since 1988, am I correct? Yeah. And uh, basically we keep a record of all big five sightings um, after every single game drive. And even if we're out in the field, not on a game drive, and we see some of the big five species, we'll record that. If they're doing anything interesting, we'll also note that. And if there's anything else that's interesting, maybe serval or caracal or anything like that, we'll add it to our um, game report book. Yes. Gareth, can I just ask the other Gareth a question? Yeah? And, yeah. and I know it's meant, meant to, the questions are meant to come from, from outside, but um, I just wanted to find out, so photographically inclined, 
Is that essentially saying that most of the Mala Mala ranges are photogenic? We'll let the viewers decide. Yeah, let the viewers decide. <laughs> so just, just for clarification, if you guys want to know, there's two Garrett's here. Um, I know some of you may know my voice, some of you that have uh, been with us in the past. Um, and then Gareth in frame is also referred to as G-Nut. And you would have seen G-Nut in some of our YouTube, uh, YouTube videos. Um, you'll also notice that he's half fixed his glasses. Yeah, unlike Peter, I don't use press stick, and I use super glue and it's super work speed. <laughs> okay, so now Genot has uh, given his perspective. Do the guides actually help? <laughs> the guides are, are critical. They, 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 they collect all the information. We, we, there wouldn't be a, a, a research study here with, without them. They, 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 they really do. They, they, they enable this, this project. Um, and, and it really is now. It's, it's the seminal study on leopards. There's, there's nothing to match it with regards to the length of time that, that, uh, um, that, that, that different individuals have been tracked. Uh, what we know about those particular individuals, who they interact with, um, what they're killing, what they're doing on a daily basis. So it really is, it's a, it's a unique data set. I, I would say not just for leopards, but for, for cats generally. There's very few studies that could rival this. Um, maybe the Serengeti Lion Project, where they've been following uh, that population for 60 years and, and similarly the, the cheetah population there. But, but otherwise, this is, this is unique. And, it, and it's what I love is it's, 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 it's a robust scientific study but it's it's on the back of a, a, a ecotourism operation and yeah. so it, it's it's those two initiatives working very closely together and 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 it, and it yeah and it and, and coming up with um both the means of protecting this, this this beautiful area but as well as us learning a great deal about a species which can then inform their conservation so it is it's been an incredible synergy between between mala mala between the other reserves and and panthera yeah. So long made last. Yeah. And I know, you know, in the past with communications a little bit slow before the internet. And um, you know, from a guide's perspective, we you know, seeing guests on a daily basis, um, sort of disseminating this information. And in the past it would have gone through, you know, research into books, into textbooks, and you know, years down the line the guide picks up a book and reads about it. And um it's old news by then yeah. and so from a guide's perspective having these projects like Panthera I know you've got a Warnbill project some people that are working on our grasses here as well it definitely helps us inform the public so we appreciate all the scientists come and do the work here as well it's like real time yeah. information to share with guests and to have a proper understanding of what's going on through like the Panthera system and understanding the cats and their movements and real time data is quite nice you don't have to dig in the in the books from 30 years ago to explain something that's happening we can explain it because we understand it quite well and, and it really was so I, I i was a guide at one stage as well and um i remember then basing my knowledge and what i was telling guests on samples was sort of so based on and and from just a few parts of leopard and so they gave us a, a tiny snapshot into the biology of the species whereas now we finally have that data the sample sizes to be able to really tease apart the various different drivers that that um, that regulate leopard populations and like i said not only is it interesting interesting for the guides to then be able to make more i guess informative conversation but it, we can actually use that information to better protect the species to conserve the species okay so on that point why do we need to conserve Leopards and carnivores. Well, it's a it's, it's a really good question. Um, I'm gonna answer the the, the the second one first. So carnivores generally, um, because they sit at the top of the food chain, it, it typically means that if you're protecting carnivores, you're often protecting most of the species that fall below them on that food chain. So they are what is what is often referred to as an umbrella species. So protect one lion and you protect all the biodiversity that that lion relies on to survive its, itself. To, to, to generate the resources we need to protect an area. So that that sort of and 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 again, healthy ecosystems re require carnivores. They 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 they, they fulfil a, a very important role when it comes to ensuring that ecosystems functioning naturally. So so that's with 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 that's generally with carnivores. Um, leopards. It, it's interesting. I I often and this is even within Banthera. They leopards are often assumed to warrant very little conservation concern. They they. They're thought of as this incredibly resilient, adaptable species, and it's—I guess—it's because they're often found 
in closer proximity to people than, than, than many other large carnivores. They, they have a, this extensive geographic distribution, so people think, well, leopards are fine. It doesn't really matter what we do to leopards, they, they, they'll, they'll always be able to survive. Their numbers will be able to bounce back. And, and as we get to know more and more about leopard populations across their range, we're realizing that that's not the case, that, that in most places leopards are in real danger. Um, populations are, are often free fall, and unfortunately now when we go in, and, and because they're very elusive, we have to use, um, we have to use technology and survey cats to w work out if they're there, to work out how many are there. And when we start using those intense research techniques, we often find that leopards have they've been extirpated, they've been wiped out of many systems where we just assume they're doing well. And so, in, even in places like South Africa, leopard populations are, are probably doing worse than, than rhinos or than lions. And, and, um, and, and you'd never imagine that from the, the media or, or talking to government officials or, or so, even to field guides. Yeah? So, what, what is leopard's greatest threat? Sure. So, that, that again varies across their range. Um, so in, in many places, leopards come into competition with people for um, the, the, uh, the risk that they are perceived to pose to, to livestock, to, to people's lives. Um, leopards are, are trophy hunted in many parts of their range. That, that can actually be, that can be a, a useful sort of tool for conservation if it's well managed. Um, unfortunately, because it, it vast sums of money involved, often um, there's a tendency to over harvest the cats. But I would say here in Southern Africa, um, Without doubt, the, the, the gravest threat that, that the species is faced is, is because of the skin trade. Now, the, the legal skin trade um, for all spotted cats was, was always a, a, a very significant threat. Um, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, it was predominantly uh, an international trade. It was for the, the fur coat uh, trade. And so Western markets, this is when, when fur coats were still popular. Then it was estimated that maybe 5,000 leopards were being killed each year demand for, for, for spotted cat skins. Um, thankfully, with tight quickly almost overnight, but now we see a new trade. And this is a uh, leopards are, are revered in many African cultures and um, and, and, and leopard skins are worn as, as, as a symbol of prestige or power and um, and there's several ethnic groups that, that do that. And it used to be it used to be regulated I guess to, to, to sometimes royalty or high ranking dignitaries but those cultural taboos seem to have broken down. And now we see just, yeah, between religions and cultures, thousands of users of leopard skins. And, and I would say that is by far the, the gravest threat, at least here regionally, that, that the species face. Okay. Folks, I'm just going to take, we're going to take a brief pause, just because my mouth is incredibly dry. <laughs> and I want to have a sip of water. But while we take this pause, uh, please go and have a look at panthera.org. This is Panthera's website. Um, if you do want to um, donate, please feel free to do so. They do have donate buttons on their webpage. Uh, obviously, this is kinds of research which is involved in Mala Mala, not only here, but all over the world. I think it's uh, the largest big cat Absolutely. NGO. Yeah. Um, so you'll be, it'll be money well spent. And um, I'm going to get back to what that money is spent on just in a second. Uh, but there's also, if you go to Marla Marla's uh, webpage, we've also got a donate button, which also goes towards research. And some of that money is spent on camera traps. I'm going to talk a bit about camera traps in a second. Um, from Marla Marla's perspective, a lot of it would be spent on our anti-poaching unit um, to protect these animals in the reserve. Obviously, there's poaching that goes wherever there's wildlife. We've just spoke a little bit about that. So please feel free to donate to either or both. Uh, we would appreciate that. And if anybody, I see, usually everybody's got lots of questions, and today everybody's very quiet. So I don't know if anybody has any more questions, but let us have a sip of water so that we can also just wet our mouths and continue talking. You, know. you guys. Uh... Blown away by you saying that you were photogenic. Yeah. yeah. Is that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> Can I say that? <laughs> Guys, just having a laugh. <laughs> okay. Right, folks. So it was just a quick water break. So we're currently sitting wherever we are at Mala Mala. We'd be sitting in a leopard or a pride of lions territory. And right now, whose territory are we sitting in? Do you know? 
So we're currently in the Maxims Males Territory and the Inkelvani Females Territory. So, Maxims Male is an interesting case. Some of you who follow our cats will know that Maxims Male is kind of the new kid on the block. He's been around for about a year and he's pushed the Senior Bush Male West. And um, he may even be right here somewhere. He loves to hang out in these reeds in front of us here. Now, this morning we had him maybe 500 meters to our south, but in the mountains of the reeds. Uh, maybe while we're sitting here, he will show up. Yeah, that would be nice. Um, so, yeah, like Gina says, they saw him this morning. And now, it's interesting for us because he's quite a nervous leopard, so we assume that he's come from Kruger National Park. And we don't know much about Kruger National Park leopards because in Kruger National Park um, there aren't guides working areas as thoroughly as they are here in the Sabi Sands or to our, to our west in the Sabi Sands or on Mala Mala. And um, the, the leopards aren't as relaxed around vehicles in the Kruger as they are here in the Sabi Sands and in Mala Mala. So we assume that the Maxims male has come from the Kruger National Park. Um, Guy, I know you've got you collecting data from Kruger, from Sabi Sands, from Mala Mala, from all over the shop. Can you just tell us exactly how you go about collecting that data? Now we've spoken a little bit about the guide's input uh, from us collecting data for you. Um, how else? Sure. Yeah. So, so, three main methods um, on this on this project. Um, as, as you said, the guides, the sightings, uh, data which they capture in, in a, a customized software which we've developed. Um, and that's rolled out um, across about 20 lodges, uh, so Mala Mala and then several lodges in the Sabi Sand Game Reserve and, and, and some lodges in the Sabi Game Reserve, um, all capturing uh, standardized data for us um, from every sighting. Uh, I think we, so in total we have about 90,000 leopard sightings uh, within our, within our, our, our database. Um, each year we get about 10,000 sightings a year across the, that study area. And yeah, rem remarkable. Like I said, just just incredible. And anywhere between 80 and 100 leopards, which are being tracked at any given time in the the 60,000 hectare reserve, greater reserve, um, we get similar sightings data on lions. Uh, maybe 6,000 lion sightings a year, one and a half thousand dog sight, wild dog sightings, uh, almost a thousand cheetah sightings. So th that's that's awesome. We're not just learning about the leopards. We're learning about the whole large carnival guild, which obviously has a a significant influence on what leopards do and, and how they behave but um but then in, in kruger um it's not as easy we we, we don't have these photogenic guides to re rely on so um it's gonna be a theme. Yeah, there's gonna be a theme <laughs> clearly but uh so there we 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 rely more on on technology so we have um camera traps these are remote triggered cameras i i've got one of them here so um this is this is the, we, we we develop our own camera trap. This is probably the most widely utilized tool uh, for cat, cat research and, and many other species. But um, this is a it's a camera with a, a motion detector. That's a guy. Actually, bring it a bit closer to yeah, the camera there. Ab absolutely. And and so what that motion detector does is it's uh, it basically picks up changes in temperature as an animal moves across um, the front of the screen, takes a photograph, and um, if it's a leopard, it's fantastic. We can recognize the individual because they each have unique spot patterns. It's, it's a bit like a human fingerprint. So we can tell which, which cat it is. And then we can use strong, uh, these powerful statistical models to estimate the numbers of leopards within a particular area. Um, also, we, we don't obviously get just photographs of leopards. We get photographs, photographs of Gnut. We get photographs of, of Gareth <laughs> coming past. We get photographs of... Funny faces. Yeah, all, all sorts of things. Um, and so we can we can estimate the numbers tells us a huge amount about where leopards occur and, and how many they are and if we do those surveys over time so this is the second time now we're running a camera trap survey on Mala Mala uh, we can see how populations change over time which from a, a management perspective is probably the most important so information on, on population trend and, and we run these surveys here in, on Mala Mala in the Sabi Sands and, and then also in Kruger and, and we know from our long-term research that the population here on Mala Mala is at capacity. This is, is this is probably the best protected leopard population in the world. Leopard population in the world, and we know 
it is at that level which is set sort of by, by prey, by other competitors, and it remains relatively stable over time. So we can use this as our control. We can use this to say, okay, this is how many leopards should be in this area. How does that compare to different parts of Kruger where they might be more heavily impacted by poaching? Or on neighboring community areas where they, they come into conflict with, with farmers, with, uh, with, with, um, yeah, just with, with people generally. And, um, and so then we, we have a sort of a benchmark on what to aim for when it comes to uh, rolling out our conservation programs and also to, to determine what types of interventions might be more applicable in these different sites. Um, I've got a, a PhD student currently working on these surveys. So I think she's, she's running about uh, 10 surveys across the, the broader Kruger area. And, um, and already the results have been illuminating. So like I say, we, we typically talk about population density. So this would be the number of leopards per square kilometer or per 100 square kilometers. And here at Mala Mala, which is some of the highest densities in the world, we get about 10 or 11 leopards per 100 square kilometers. And you could contrast that to a place in the, the central to core of the Kruger, where leopards we assume are quite protected because it's just quite far from the boundaries, so near Low Asabi or Skakuza. And there it drops down to about seven or eight leopards per 100 square kilometers, so still reasonably high. But if we get much closer to the boundaries, to Pretorius Corp, uh, to um, Inwanetsi, all of these which are hard up against the boundaries, that's right down to three leopards per hundred square kilometers. And yet the habitat is very good. There's lots of food, there's, there's, there's wonderful cover. So we would expect similar leopard numbers, but it's much lower. And we assume that's probably because of poaching or cats moving up the reserve and being persecuted when they do that. So we, may, we see this whole gradient of density as you move from a very well protected population to one which is still in a protected area but just because of its proximity to people is under much greater pressure and then we can start intervening to try and recover those numbers now what what sort of interventions do you undertake okay. so it, it, it depends here um in kruger would be working very closely with the, the, the statutory authority so with the south, south african uh, national parks to, to better protect leopards so that's through anti-poaching measures it could be working with the communities so engaging very closely with the communities living on the boundaries to work out how they perceive leopards and other wildlife are these are they typically perceived as a disadvantage are there ways that we can change that to be advantageous um, i mentioned that one of the real threats to leopards is this demand for skins people wear leopard skins as a, as a status symbol so um, one of our very effective projects has been developing uh, faux leopard skins these these synthetic skins to replace fake skins uh, to sorry, to replace authentic skins mm. and um and and yeah and that has been remarkably successful we've worked with several ethnic groups now the, the biggest one is a um it's a, actually a religious group called the, the nazareth baptist church or the shembi church uh, there are there are literally millions of, of of shembi members many of whom desire a leopard skin they, they see it as a, a means of being able to worship and um and we've worked very closely with uh, the, the, the church leadership to, to, to try and embrace a sort of a conservation ethos. And they are now sort of, they promote, they endorse this use of, of synthetic skins. And we've, we've donated over 18,000 of these, these faux skins. And essentially, every, every faux skin donated is a, is a leopard saved. And, 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 um, and so I think that has been a, a very effective um, program. And we've seen leopard numbers in, um, in, in places which were previously heavily posted. Uh, poached start to rebound, start to recover, and that that documented through these camera traps. So that's how it that's all comes news. together. And then just a curiosity, you mentioned that you developed this camera trap yourself. Why? So, or so not yourself, your organizer. Maybe you did yourself. I don't know. Did I, you? I absolutely didn't do it myself. <laughs> okay. I, I I I cannot operate even a cellular phone. <laughs> okay. So no, I'm banned from all technology. But um, but but we 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 rely incredibly heavily on these. We we produce about five thousand of these each year. And we use these across Asia, Africa, Latin America. They are the best ways of, of, of surveying cats, of counting cats. Um, while we did it ourselves, typically the only people that were using these remote cameras previously were, were hunters. They were putting them up at, at deer blinds to be able to see when a sort of, a, a, I guess, a trophy animal would come in. And because of that, they were, they were designed accordingly. So they had relatively slow trigger speeds, not particularly user-friendly for what we wanted, where we needed to deploy them rapidly access some downloaded images quickly we need a very 
fast trigger speed and we need it to be cost effective when you're making 5,000 of these and, and putting them out in the field every year it, it, it just made sense to do it ourselves and so we could we could we could customize it to our needs and so okay. this is now the, the seventh generation we we've 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 come in a lot when I did my PhD we were we were still using a print version um, that's that's how old I am <laughs> but um, but now this is it's digital it all runs off Bluetooth so we have an application it's yeah researchers these days way too yeah. easy just uh, <laughs> I did it it's super super user friendly and, and very effective and and we we, yeah, we we learn a great deal about the cats from this okay Peter if you're watching uh, will you just let me know if uh, there are people asking questions I don't see any showing up on my uh, my phone here so I just want to make sure it's not just a, a technical error so excuse me guy for a second sure. just want to check my messages here um, uh, here we go. I'm getting some messages. Oh, we are getting questions. I just can't see them. Oh. Yeah, we're going to try do this again. Oh, here we are. <laughs> oh. Here's some catch up to Good you. day, folks. I'm not, I'm not the only one that should be bad <laughs> for the cell phone. Yeah, yeah there, there we, we go. go. So, Annie, welcome. Um, here for his perspective on poaching of big cats. I can answer. No, you can answer that. So now, yeah. I, I frown upon it. Um, no, it's it's uh, yeah, it, 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 it's a it's a real issue. Um, not just for leopards, for for most cats. Uh, two different types of poaching, I guess. Um, the 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 indirect, the more incidental poaching, where where snares are set um, typically for bush meat, so these would be for antelope. Um, but but because they are unselective, many carnivores are caught in that. Uh, even if carnivores aren't caught in in, in snares, um, they can severely reduce prey numbers. And if leopards don't have food, then they can't survive. So that's one type of poaching that we have to, to deal with. Um, and then then there's the more targeted poaching. So where because there is this real demand for leopard skins, so where where um, poachers will come in they might uh, lace lace a carcass with poison um, so specifically targeting leopards or will hang up a, a, a bait in a tree and put snares around there and um, and so we, we 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 have to try to combat both of those um, and that's done through, through various different means so some of it is done by engaging communities like I say trying to increase the benefits that people living with wildlife can um, can realize and then also working with protected area staff to, to better secure um, leopard and other carnivore habitat. So to, to improve the, the protection of, of those areas. Okay, and then Mia Ferreira, welcome back, uh, saying, is it true that there is no such thing as black panthers? They are black leopards. Leopards, is it true? Question mark. It is hard time. Yeah, it, um, it, it, it is true. It's just another name for a black leopard. Um, so, so, so black leopards are they're, they're just a it's a melanistic version of the the spotted cat that we see here um we don't we don't get black leopards in in mala mala in, in south africa probably the furthest south that you would find um, um black leopards in in africa is in um oh, closer to the equator in, in in northern kenya ethiopia those areas um still quite rare there but many of our projects in asia so in southeast asia in countries like malaysia and thailand where these are dense forested habitats all of the leopards there are, are, are black um, just that that black peelage is, is much better suited to that type of an, an environment they, they're that much more camouflaged and um, and yeah better better to hunt I have I've, I've worked on some of our projects and um, there yeah, there's leeches there's pretty much anything that gives you a rash okay. stings or bites you but um, but yeah that's that's where they typically occur okay excellent miss Adam Andrus, welcome any painted wolf um, okay, I'm just gonna say scroll through some of these uh, messages I see you've got a lot more people now that we're starting to answer your questions sorry about that <laughs> um, here's a question why do most cats like leopards dislike water do leopards dislike water 100% or I like most cats are all cats the same maybe let's ask it that way sure so, so no um, some cats actually very much like water so um tigers seem to to, to, to quite enjoy water um, probably the most no the most aquatic large cat i should i should say so there's a fishing cat which spends a lot of time in water but that's a small cat but um 
the most aquatic large cat is a, a jaguar. Um, they, they spend a great deal of time in water um, catching caiman, so the, the, I guess the South American version of a, a crocodile, um, capybaras, which are a large rodent that live along rivers. So um, they're very aquatic, and, and, and leopards here um, do cross the rivers uh, when they're flowing. Um, they, well, there's records from, uh, from Mala Mala of, of leopards being killed by crocodiles. But, um, but so, so, so they, they don't, both leopards and lions don't he hesitate to get wet. Um, cheetah, I don't know if I, I've, I've actually seen cheetah swimming, but, but there's records of it. So, so no, they, 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 they'll get wet, wet if, if necessary. Okay. Then to you, Hans, are you still busy there? No. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back, Johan. Um, we just Sammy Jane. Welcome back. Uh, Any? Okay, let's see. Erika Kovacs. Welcome. Johan de Plessy asking, do you guys also do work in EZ, KZN? We do, and in, in, um, that's where I, I am assuming you may be referring to Isambelo KwaZulu Natal Wildlife, which is the, the provincial authority in the KwaZulu Natal province. Uh, we, we do a lot of work there, um, similarly running camera traps across most of the protected areas uh, in, in the province. So, some of the better known ones are Shushui Umfalozi Game Reserve, Kuzi Game Reserve, uh, Tembi Game Reserve. Um, so, we, we, we also run regular surveys, and that helps inform management. And that is one of the strongholds of the Shembi Church that I was talking about. So we do a lot of community work through the, the KwaZulu-Natal province and, and with the provincial authority with EKZ and Wildlife. Okay, I'm just trying to see some more questions here. There's a lot of people saying hello. Um, okay, so Miss Anna Mandras, and maybe this is for you, Nikki. Uh, I'm going to have to get out of the way and maybe turn the camera so Nikki can answer this. Um, but the question is, can you elaborate on genealogical research you're doing with Sabi Sands and Malamala? What are you doing with a scat? So maybe you just want to um, speak us through... Excuse me folks, going to get a bit wobbly for a second. Speak us through the... Okay, there we go. Do you want me to again? Sure. Yeah, if you can handle that for a second. Thank you. Um, so the SCAT collection is done here in Malamala and the Sabi Sands um, in order to get DNA samples from the resident cats. And so how that works is on the outside of the SCAT there are cells from the leopard um, that have collected there as it's passed through the digestive tract. So it's typically not a lot of cells, but there are enough for us to get the DNA of the leopard. Um, and that enables us to do a lot of things, particularly in a population like this where the individuals are well known. So moms are known, cubs are known, and having the DNA from males enables us to be able to work out who the father of the cubs are. Um, and that's, that's great from an individual point of view and it's lovely to know and work out the dynamics on the ground. Um, but DNA is also really useful for informing conservation. Um, particularly some of the cryptic behaviors and processes that we, we don't always know are playing out um, without being able to dive deeper using DNA. So for example, um, different populations usually have um, different, slightly different genetic signatures. So if you have a new sample, a new DNA profile of a leopard, you can often tell the area that it originated from. So this can be used in something like the illegal wildlife trade. If we get a, a sample of a skin, of a, a confiscated um, illegally poached skin, um, we can use DNA to pinpoint where that leopard was poached. And this can identify hotspots, poaching hotspots, that we may not have known that occurred. Um, and this can then inform the conservation and protection of leopards in those areas. So, SCAT's a great way to collect DNA from wildlife. It's non-invasive, as long as you as you know the ID of the individual um, and you, you can use it to piece together these familial relationships as well as inform um, quite a lot of conservation. Um, and it's, it's obviously, it's easy to collect and as long as you can get good DNA from that sample, it's a great way to do it. Great. And then, uh, Guy, thank you, Nikki. <laughs> My pleasure. Then Guy, here's a question here. Um, do you want to go for it? Sure. Uh, hi, John Sanders. Um, I saw a, a video 
featuring a hyena attack against a, gr a group of lionesses and their cubs. Most of the lions disappeared. Uh, one lioness basically uh, performed a, a rear guard action. Was it deliberate? Um, I, I would assume so. Um, I, I, lions, uh, lions and hyenas will, will fight quite regularly. Um, and lionesses will vigorously defend their youngsters against um, any threat, uh, even male lions, where they they stand little chance given the, the size difference. So I I yeah I would I would guess it probably was a, a rear guard action, and um, and, and lionesses are they they for the most part great mums. Then uh, Kimberly Lopez, how do we go about financially supporting Panthera? Kimberly, you can go to panthera.org. Your homepage, you should find it. And then Matt, please say hi to Megan van Staden's mom. She watches you every day. Hi, Megan van Staden's mom. <laughs> I'm glad that you're joining us. We really enjoy the comments that you guys, um, or we enjoy having the company and all the questions here. I'm sorry that it's taken so long to, to get to these questions, but we're here now. Um, okay, I'm just gonna... Okay, goodbye Reaper Man, it's midnight here in Sydney, Australia, off to bed. Okay, and here's one, uh, Carol Hall. Do you know how prevalent bovine TB is within the Sabi San Malamala leopard population? So I'm going to hand this one over um, to Nikki because she worked on um, bovine uh, TB in, in, in Kruger for quite some time. I, I, I know that there has been uh, leopards which have tested positive. Uh, in the reserve in the past, I, I, I'm gonna let Nikki answer. I don't think it's a major problem for this, the population, but I'm gonna bounce it straight back to Guy because, <laughs> as he mentioned, my bovine TV work was in Kruger, but also on buffalo. So, <laughs> so I think he's trying to shirk the responsibility for this one. Um, so leopards do do get TV. They can do. I know they have in the park, um, but, but yeah, it's usually there is what's called a spillover host normally. So leopards don't um, they don't transmit and maintain TB within the leopard population, but sometimes they get it incidentally. Um, you I've got 40 years now of, of, of life history data, of demographic data, and we have a, a great deal of information about what the main causes of leopard deaths are, of, of mortality. Um, disease, TB, uh, other types of disease, uh, sarcoptic mange, um, does crop up time to time, but it, it is a it, it's probably only responsible for less than five percent of deaths. So, so it is not a it's not a major driver of this system. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be vigilant and and, and be uh, uh, be aware if if, if, if um, some type of epidemic would would move through. I guess it's quite poignant at the moment. Um, an example of this in a cat population would have been in the Serengeti. Um, oh, I think it was back in the, the early 90s. Um, where um, distemper, canine distemper got into the lion population and that, that population is roughly was then about 3,000 odd lions and it killed a third of the population in six months. Um, but even there with such a sort of catastrophic um, population decline within a few years that population had bounced back and now is actually significantly higher than it was at that stage. So, so cats typically if, you, you, if the conditions suit their numbers can rebound quickly but, but yeah Long, long answer to that. Uh, disease in this particular system is is not a, a significant cause of leopard uh, deaths. Great. And then, uh, Black Freak asking, do you then use the information to also form territorial maps of the leopards and or lions? Uh, we do do that. I know you do in your system, and we also do that here at Mala Mala. It helps us in guiding, um, and I'm sure it helps you with your research as well. Absolutely. So we use those sightings, um, and the nice thing is because because Mala Mala, but many of the the, the surrounding reserves are um, are capturing data, um, and and the cats obviously restricted. Um, we can we can map those territories. We can see where individuals go and and, and who they're inter interacting with, and um, and that's a, a key part of the research. Okay, and then. Uh King of the beast, how do you classify lions? Do you use the eight subspecies method or the three subspecies method? So by king of the beast, I, I'm guessing you're referring to leopards, obviously. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so, um, so, so that, that eight, eight recognized subspecies would be, I guess, the method in that, and, um, and that, yeah, that's, that's the more uh, 
I guess the recent uh, classification. Um, it, it needs to be up that there's, at the moment there's that examples have been collected and, and, and detailed analyses undertaken that that will probably be split into more subspecies. Again, from our perspective, it, it's more the sort of the model of the meaning for conservation units, and they don't necessarily align with subspecies classifications. But um, but it is it's an ongoing debate among the geneticists. And then Hermie 789 Nikki just saying, how does your skin? She goes. She went on safari and sun kicked my butt. Biting flies would have eaten us alive. <laughs> so we have chosen to sit in the shade because uh, there's a you know although it's quite cool during the winter here, the sun still does get hold of us. Um, but I notice you are a little bit sunburned. <laughs> I am. Um, it is. It's been a real treat to be in the sun the last couple of days, yeah. setting up camera traps. Um, yeah, having been in Cape Town, it's not as sunny there, not as cold. Yeah. So Sheesh. I've taken the opportunity. Yeah, to all of you in Cape Town, bearing the brunt of that cold front, you're thinking of you. I know Bev says you say you're from Cape Town. Um, do you think leopards in Zululand will ever be as habituated as in the Sabi Sands? AP from Durban. Um, maybe I, I would hope so. I, I lived and worked in in Pinda Private Game Reserve for, for many years and um, and when I first started working there uh, our best sight of a leopard was basically only sighting of a leopard was always just a flash of spots and um, and and over after sort of 10 years that we spent there um, both with some significant changes to conservation policy in the province and the country um, numbers were able to rebound and also then with some very sensitive viewing by the um, by the, the guides there they, 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 they operate similarly here to Mala Mala um, cats started to habituate and, um, and and Nikki and I actually visited Pinda uh, last year and it was it was a real treat we, we had several leopard sightings and it was it was great to be able to see how that population has changed over time um, again so it's a combination of a leopards being able to survive for long enough to get habituated and then for the field guides putting in the hard yards and, and being very sensitive to the cats and, and a lot. Yeah, I know from our perspective, when we first arrived here as a guide, and I'm sure it's like this throughout the Sabi Sands, you've, there's a lot of emphasis that is put on how to drive around these animals. And we've got a long history of driving around uh, the cats or animals uh, that we mostly work for cats and certain big five species. And we have, we use, a fleet of the same vehicles, we drive in the same gear, we always approach at the same angle and we just try and stay as consistent as possible um, when we do approach these cats. If it is a nervous cat we'll give them some time to get used to us, maybe not approach as close as we usually would and then eventually they do relax and it just takes a mother um, to become relaxed and then the youngsters follow suit. Johan Duplessis asking a question here, um, in the large park areas where vehicle access is limited, do you guys walk into those areas to place cameras? Do you make use of helicopters, tracking leopards by vehicle, foot, helicopter, drones? So typically by foot. Um, so in, 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 in places like Kruger, um, uh, most sites, 90% of the sites that we work in, we have to, uh, we have to walk. We do a lot of walking in, uh, in, and, and with Liam we were able to put up, uh, I think, 12 stations. Um, working in some countries like Saudi Arabia or Mongolia, um, where these sort of big mountains where leopards live, we maybe we're lucky if we get one station up a day. So, um, so yeah, we rely on um, yeah. There, there, it's 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 a bit harder. It's all done done by foot, but but lovely to be out there hiking. Um, every now and again, we've we've uh, I've, I've gone up in a helicopter and been dropped off at a station. Normally, as part of an anti-poaching uh, operation. Then you really do feel like a rock star, but um, but that's not the norm, unfortunately. <laughs> All right, um, Annie just commenting on the epaulets, saying she loves epaulets. Uh, we can get you guys some. Love, you love some Thank epaulets, you. definitely. <laughs> and here we go. Do the ill skinny leopards seen have bovine TV from a TV from painted wool? I. I is that is looking in poor condition uh, maybe it's uh, it's it's been injured while hunting um, and it's struggling to feed itself maybe it's a youngster which is still developing its hunting techniques so that doesn't necessarily always mean that it's um, that it has TB it might um, but but the, the condition of the cat is not a is not the sort of the, the first symptom that you would look for here as a, as a, as a 
is an indication that it's disease. There could be many other reasons why that cat is, is in, in poor health. Normally, so most causes of, of leopard death here are, tend to be violent. It's, it's because they, so the primary cause of death is other leopards. Um, uh, males killing cubs, so committing infanticide. Um, when a new male comes into area, sometimes you might even kill um, another male or even adult females. Um, they can try and defend their, their, um, their youngsters. So, so that is the, the leading cause of leopard mortality is other leopards. Um, following that, it'd be lions. Uh, hyenas um, so that is that would probably count for so what, what we would term inter and an intra specific mortality would probably account for about 90 percent of deaths and then it's drowning fires um, disease um, or when and, uh, cubs are orphaned if their mother is killed and um, every now and again starvation but but very very rarely in this particular population then luck tbg do you guys ever run into poachers if so what do you do when you run into them uh, luck we don't run into poachers they for the most part don't want to be seen there are poachers throughout africa or all over in the world wherever there's wildlife just about you'll find poachers um, but for the most part they don't want to be seen so we don't we barely ever run into them um miss anamandra is saying i'm guessing his favorite is a leopard guy is that true <laughs> <laughs> I still get it as excited. Um, we saw the Maxims Mel, uh, Gareth and, and Liam, they did a great job in finding them and I, I seriously, this is no, no, no exaggeration, I, I as I'm excited now as I was the first time I saw a leopard as a young kid, so I think about that, I'd stop doing this. No, definitely my favourite. How about you, Nikki? Also my favourite. That's a leopard. I know a lot of the guides here, just, I mean, I mean it's leopard country this, mm. um, and a lot of the guides here are leopard mad. I certainly enjoy leopards. How about you, Gina? Should we tell you if one sneaks up behind you there? You should, you should tell me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's quite interesting because between ourselves, uh, you know, we've got a YouTube channel. If any of you folks don't know about our YouTube channel, we can only live stream in on about 10% of the property where we have live stream coverage or we have cell phone coverage. Um, but for the rest of the sightings, we take videos and then uh, we upload them on our YouTube channel. So if you haven't seen those, please go have a look. Uh, we went to Marla Marla, they were working on the neighbor's property and we bumped into them on the boundary. We made a little video of that, so I hope you guys don't mind. <laughs> okay. Go for it. And then uh, just interestingly, it, it seems like a lot of the public out there really enjoy the lions. So our lion... Um, videos do really well but not necessarily leopards i know there's a lot of locals here maybe you guys want to tell us what your favorites are bug freak saying is her a concern when it comes to animals easy it's a difficult one to answer i think i, I don't know I, I would suggest not um as i was mentioning when we were talking about the reserves in kwazulu natal um it, it's only when when reserves are, are very well protected that, that animals can habituate, that there is an opportunity to habituate um, leopards. And so, so it's, I guess this is the case of the, the, the protection has to come first. So only once those, those cats are sufficiently secure, will they become a, relaxed enough to view. Um, and, and so generally that only happens where they, they, they are at, at little risk. Um, and, and so no, I think, that, I think the advantages that you can get from a, a, a habituated leopard um, in, in being able to showcase, or yeah, showcase the species, and, and being such an attraction from a, a ecotourism perspective is, is far more benefit than than any potential harm that habituation may pose. Yeah. So on that uh, on that note for poaching, if anybody wants to uh, lend a hand, used for our anti poaching team, and some of the money will be used for these camera traps as well, um, amongst other things. You can just uh, have a look on our website to get more details there. And then here's a question from my mum. <laughs> is the bone trade starting to have an impact on poaching of cats in Africa, or is it mainly for skins or protecting cattle against predators, etc., in Tanzania and Kenya? So I know you've answered some of that uh, with regards to the skins. Did you say this was from your mum? This is from my mum, yeah. So you have to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> my mum from Ryan. It's nice to, nice to meet you. Um, it, it is a concern. It's um, not so much that we know of with leopards. Um, but certainly with lions, uh, the bone trade appears to be on the increase. Um, probably the best evidence for that comes from a, a, a nearby reserve. Um, just on the, the eastern boundary of Kruger is the Limpopo National Park. 
and Panthera ran a, a project there for uh, many years where we were documenting uh, multiple incidents of targeted poaching of lions and, and interviews uh, with informants um, suggested that those, those were four bones that were, were, were bones. But these are typically um, being used as a proxy for tiger bones. So tiger bone wine is, 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 a, is, is in great demand for the traditional um, uh, Far Eastern medicine markets. And, um, and, and this was always the, the sort of major threat to tigers. And now, um, I guess as tiger, tiger numbers have decreased, it looks like um, that, 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 that other cats are being sourced, either to be sold as tigers or to be sold even under their own species name. So it's certainly something that we've got our eye on. And, um, and, and yeah, um, so, so both here and in East Africa, there, there seems to be a, a general increase. We don't yet know the scale of the trade. It's, it's because all of these are legal activities, because of their illicit nature, it's hard to quantify. But we, we're doing a great deal of work on that to, to get to the bottom of it and then see how best to address that. Then Maggie and Gordon Higginbottom, welcome back. Uh, how long, maybe this is for you, Nikki, how long do the numbers, how low do the numbers of leopards have to sink to before the genetic pool becomes non-viable? So that's a difficult one to answer specifically, but with leopards, um, I think the numbers could go incredibly low because they're very good dispersers. So the danger mostly comes when you've got a small population that goes very low and it's it's very tightly controlled. We know with leopards, they, they really can move. They don't easily get restricted into one small place. So you'll, you'll have young animals moving sometimes vast distances um, to, to spread their genes elsewhere. And so as long as there's even just a little bit of connectedness between populations, um, even very low numbers in one area doesn't necessarily mean that anything negative is happening. So it's really about connectivity between, between leopards um, rather than numbers per se. Okay, here's another one. Um, thank you. King of the beast. How prevalent are cheetahs, servals, caracals, and other small cats in South Africa? I think it depends very much where you go to. I know GNUT's discovered a few of the smaller predators on Mala Mala with the camera traps. Um, but I don't know who wants to answer that one. Yeah, I, I think I think you've I, <laughs> I think you've answered it. I think it de de depends where. So they 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 favour different habitat types. So serval you generally find in. In, in grassier or wetland areas um, and, and so parts of Africa where, where they have that type of suitable habitat um, uh, civil numbers are really high uh, there was actually a, a recent paper that came up from um, oh, where was it I think Sasselberg or one of the one of these big it, it was a, it wasn't a nature reserve it was it was uh, near a sort of oil refinery and 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 there was just ridiculously high uh, several numbers, I think, because it was all the other large carnivals had been extirpated and beautiful wetland habitat with lots of rodents, and so they were doing very well. Um, caracal, um, often in the drier parts of the country, but but also they then come in um, along with with some jackal species into real conflict with with sheep farmers, um, and there's lots of persecution of caracal. Um, so so they they are they they they're found throughout, throughout much of the country, and then their status varies with regards to whether they're in a protected area or not and then what's happening if they're outside a protected area or what, what their predominant land use is. Alright. I'll try and put this up here. Okay. Gina's getting a bit tired. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Doing a sterling job, Gina. Now I'm breaking it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Painted Wolf saying... Oh no, sorry. It's the comment above that. How do you think the lion species will fare in the next 30 to 50 years? Oof, um, I, I, I hope their numbers will be able to rebound. So to, to give you an indication, um, there, it's estimated that there are maybe roughly 20,000 lions left alive today. Um, most of those lions being found in southern and East Africa. So just a a, a, a strange statistic which you might not think of is um, there's there's probably more lions left alive today than there are rhinos. A uh, fewer lions left alive today than there are rhinos. And yet often you wouldn't think of lion as a species of conservation concern. And um, so they, they, they really are, they, they, they are, they are, 
on the conservation radar. Uh, there's a lot of effort going in to try and safeguard populations. Um, for all of these cat species, I, I remain very positive um, because of the way they breed. Um, like I say, if, if, if conditions suit, they can rebound very quickly. And it's different. It's different to some working on elephants. It's a much longer lived, uh, uh, has a slower life history than, than cats do. And so then it's it's harder for those to recover those populations, for lions, for leopards. Oh, there's a leopard, there's a leopard there. There's a male leopard. Uh, Just that's walked a Maxon's male. Yeah. Do not jump in this guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well spotted. So, somewhere yeah. over there. Yeah. So. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> Check how excited he is. Uh, <laughs> okay, folks, so we didn't warn Gina about that leopard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we're just going to go see it might be the Maxim's male, uh, in which case he might be a little bit nervous, but we are going to see if we can find him. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> It was choreographed, it just, <laughs> you like strolled past so, the line here the whole time. Yeah, he's been watching us, you know, and those Franklins flew in. out. <laughs> but um, I think uh, it's, it's quite apt because I was just reading through these comments here and a lot of people have been saying that uh, their favorite is leopard as well. Hey. So we've just managed to spot one, I hope we can actually see it. Um, hey, he just walked on the road. He's yeah. Along the road. yeah. There's Franklin. Mm. So I've lost my, yeah, there we go. It's, Oops. Sorry, folks. Just trying to get our lives organized here. So he was walking just along this two track in front of us. There he is. Oh, there he is. Well done, guys. We can't see from this angle who he is, but he looks like he's coming back. Yeah. You can just see his tail. And you're saying he's nervous, eh? Yes, incredible, huh? If we're not sure who this is, if it is the Maxon's Max male, it is. So Gareth's just confirmed it is, which is quite amazing that he's this relaxed. Uh, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping all the comments are that leopards are the favorite. Yeah, there we go. Oh, beautiful cat, eh? Yeah, I want to know how you organize that. <laughs> we chose the right spot there, eh? <laughs> like, so this is uh, turned into... Okay, I don't know if you want to just scroll through. I know you want to appreciate the sighting, but I... if you do see questions you want to answer from time to time, just feel free. That's it? Tell me answers. Yeah, yeah, if you see questions that you... Hi, uh, do you know, um, the, what is the density of leopards in the broader Kruger area? So your study in, in 1983 in Walpatu, Sri Lanka, suggested a, a, at least 15 leopards per 100 square k's. Um, so it, it varies dramatically, um, probably with, uh, with a, uh, sort of a maximum density here in the Sabi Sands of um, of around 11, 12 leopards per 100 square kilometers, down to, I would guess, in some of maybe the, the less productive sites in the north, probably two, three leopards per 100 square kilometers. Some of the, the earlier density estimates for the species, um, we realize now are, are some of them are, are overestimates, and those based on telemetry data or in sightings, just because um, uh, the, the cats were often using much bigger areas than we imagined. Um, and, and then we're actually sampled and, and because of that it, 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 it overestimates uh, population density but um, but I, I have heard in, in, in well, part two that, that, that densities are, are very high so thanks for that question so hi Arjuna, Arjuna was a guest with us not so long ago and um, yeah fantastic Arjuna I hope you, you got to see some of these wonderful Mala Mala leopards yeah he certainly did Sure, he's very relaxed. He's going to an area that we can't really access. I think he'll just stand by here in the shade for now and maybe get a long distance view of him. Um, that's about as good as a Maxim's male sighting gets for the most part. There you go. He's just gone into the reeds there, so we're not going to try and follow him through there unless you want to watch us try and get unstuck.
Okay, so just back to the comments again. Uh, Miss Anamandra saying Guy has leopard eyes. Well done, Guy. Nice taller. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, welcome to Kimmy Daly, Caspi Caspi, uh, Robin Sewell Epic back at camp. Miss Anamandra saying she always wanted to see Max and Mel live. Fantastic. Yeah, brilliant. So if you can't see him, he's just standing Whoa. over there. AP Durban is Adam Parker. I've just seen a message pop up on my screen there. Parker was a, a ranger here not so long ago. How are you, Parker? Just wait to Elon Austin driver. Very amazing. Welcome back. Well, the of magic. Jacques Proust. Yeah, he's quite relaxed. A lot more relaxed than when you were here last, Jacques. Just put a thank you to Jacques. Jacques used to capture the sightings data for us a few years ago, and he, he did a wonderful job. So thank you, thank you, Jacques. Then Mrs. Lapwin, how much do you pay Maxims for his guest appearance? Now that is quite serendipitous, I must say. Gareth, I told you it wouldn't be your last Maximum sighting this morning. Yes, we go. did. <laughs> uh, Gina N saying, Mala Mala is the best and Maxim's male is my wife's favorite animal. <laughs> awesome. So this is typically what the Maxim's male does to us. You'll see him and then he disappears into the Phragmites like he's done right now. So watching him walk down the road like that isn't something that we get treated to too often. So it's quite, quite nice. And I think Guy spotted him at just the right moment. Were you getting tired of us talking? <laughs> 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 no, if, if you hadn't seen him when we did, you wouldn't have found him. Dylan Morgan, welcome. Just asking what we're looking at. Just tuned in. Dylan, we've been having a Q&A uh, with Guy and Nikki uh, from Panthera, and they've been educating us on carnivores and more specifically leopards in this area. And uh, midway through our Q&A session, Guy just happened to spot the Maxim's male leopard who strolled past us, probably not too far from Gareth. We didn't tell him about it because he was filming us. Um, but yeah, we've just been following him. He's now just walked off into the reeds. His name Patel asking if it's near Shingweti. Uh, there he is on the other side of the river there, Gia. Oh, beautiful light. Yeah, so he's just crossed the river. You see him? Oops. Um, and we don't actually see him on the eastern side of the watercourse all that often. Having said that, when he was named, he was on the eastern side of the watercourse. So he's standing. Over there. Fantastic. Yeah. Very cool. Do you want to try a loop around? Yep, yeah, we can do that. Do you want to take over the trip? There's an in there. Just an interesting fact from uh, the output from the study was that um, the diet is pilot, which was sort of a staple, but um, uh, at this time of year when there is, um, when the pilot uh, rams are, are, are rutting, so it's essentially mating season for pilots, they are very distracted and uh, all uh, adult rams and so it's a good hefty meal for a leopard but it does show you what happens when you when you have other priorities I should say okay so I've lost view of him or visual of him I think
Uh, Dylan Morgan, are you near camp? I'm gonna have to ask Gene at that. Yeah, we may be about four kilometers from. Hello, Helen in Calgary. It's a long way from here. You're gonna have to come and visit Mala Mala at some stage. Good. Ready? Can cats get COVID 19? Uh, yes, they can. Um, some tigers and other cat species tested positive for COVID at the um, Bronx Zoo uh, at a few months ago. It's very unlikely that, that they would be able to, uh, they wouldn't transmit that to, to people, and it's unlikely to have an effect on the cats themselves, but yes, they can. Apparently, Jacques Prost has got some special sorts we should hear about. Some special. <laughs> <laughs> so we are currently just south of Maxim's Lookout. Mm -hmm. And uh, Maxim's Lookout is a lookout point that overlooks this view that we see here and much much more it's a bit higher than where we are currently and the maxims male is named after that lookout point it's a fellow hard distraction during mating season is understandable <laughs> it may be but it clearly is a dangerous distraction Um, okay, here, yeah, this is Mrs. Lapwing. Um, we've seen quite a few multiple leopard sightings. Is that odd behavior or now considered the norm? I think for the most part it would still be con considered odd just because up until re very uh, recent we, we didn't have those types of data where, um, where, where animals were relaxed enough to, to allow us to, to sort of get that window into their daily lives. So, so leopards are often referred to as the quintessential solitary cat, but um, because they are so relaxed and, and, and viewed for, for so long and, and so frequently at places like Mala Mala, we have seen that they certainly they do socialize, um, that, that they are very aware of other leopards um, that either are within or bordering um, their home ranges, and, and, and quite frequently um, guides are viewing males and females sharing kills, um, sometimes males mating with two females at one time, two males mating with a female. So to types of behavior you would never, never in the past have associated with a solitary cat like a leopard. And, and hopefully as, as the study continues and, and, and we, we get to learn more about this population, we can, we can understand the, the drivers of these types of interactions and, and, and what, they, what they really do mean for, for leopard lives here. Um, but no, they, they certainly are more, more solitary than we, we assumed in the past. Just on that topic, uh, where is he? Uh, there you can, I'm going to try and zoom in here. He's just on the edge of the reeds. I don't think we'll be able to see him, but let me get my finger in the way. He's over there somewhere. He's just gone behind the reeds again. We're hoping that he pops out on that sandbank. Uh, doubt whether he will. Do you want to loop around? I think he's crossed through the river. Okay, so folks are going to leave this up to you. Should we loop around? We're going to wait 30 seconds for the response. <laughs> Um, he's looking to go. Yeah, he's looking to cross the river there. Um, Chinat, you might want to uh, answer Bianca Perry's question. <laughs> Definitely not Bianca. <laughs> Dylan Morgan asking, does this leopard have any cubs? We've seen this leopard mate with uh, the island female. We've seen him mate with, as I know the, the Three Rivers female has tried to mate with him, but I don't know if anybody's actually seen him mate with her. She's still quite young. Who else has he mated with? Inkovenu so female? Waited, waited. He's mated with uh, Inkovenu female, who currently has one cub. 
um, but she also mates it with the Senegal bush male and the flat rock male. So whether or not that cub is his cub, we wouldn't be able to tell now. But hopefully the DNA collection through the scats, and that's what um, Guy and Nikki are going to be looking into a little bit more now. We can tease apart that and figure out if he is the father of the Inkoveni female's cub. Right, so the response here is loop around, do you know? All right. Okay, so. Hold up. Guy, here we go again. You're on comments duty. <laughs> Yeah, folks, so it's going to take us about. Oops. Oops. It's going to take us about. Uh, I'm going to put it in here. Five minutes to get around that side. Uh, we just got to find a road, um, and then we're going to cross a bridge that I don't think we've driven across on a live stream. It's called West West Street Bridge. Uh, it's a lovely view from up top there. Just to 10, uh, Bengal Tiger versus African Lion, who wins? Um, I'm not too sure and I'm guessing we'll never find out given that they don't, uh, they don't occur in the same area. Uh, there are lions still in Asia in the Jeer Forest, um, but, uh, but no tigers there. Can we go past this camera station? Wanna... I think let's rather just get to the leopard. <laughs> It's not often you catch Maxim's mail, so chilled out. Yeah. You guys have yeah. bought some good juju here. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't have actually been better scripted. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. Now you know how to vegetate your cats. Yeah. Secret of reading. Guys, this is schooling us on how to find leopards at the same time. <laughs> Just put Gina out to bed. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> How successful are the South China Tigers in South Africa? Um, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that one. Um, I, I'm not too sure how that, that program is going in Colesburg. I, I know they certainly haven't um, taken those tigers back and re reintroduced them in China, which I think was the original um, idea. Um, this is. So we've got, I have a question here from Miss Anamandris, I think it is, um, or Mrs. Lapwing. Um, can leopards detect a familial connection through scenting and sores? Um, again, it's something that we that we, we would like to try to get to the bottom of. Um, is, is how do they distinguish relatedness um, between each other? Uh, I, I would assume they, they could, um, that, that through scent would be the most obvious. And yet you see bizarre behaviors that when uh, a female leopard loses its offspring, often she will hoist that offspring, feed on it, and then spend some time in an area calling for the cub. So almost not recognizing that she's been, been feeding on her own cub. Um, also, we, we, they, they, we, we, they, there haven't been um, experiments done with leopards, but there have been uh, experiment playback experiments done with lions whereby they've 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 recorded uh, the calls of, of known lions and they've played those back to either relatives or unfamiliar individuals and certainly the response shows that that for relatives they often will not respond um, if they hear a relative calling nearby but if an unfamiliar animal is is is, is played back within their territory they, they will respond very rapidly so that suggests that they can actually distinguish um, whether that animal is related or not, it's kin or not. Another interesting fact, um, cats can count during the same types of experiments. They, um, they played, so if they had a, a pride of, of three lionesses lying in the center of their territory, then they would play back one lioness to that, those three. And, and almost every time the three would respond, there's an elephant over there. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know how Malamala find any animals if Panthera is not here. But, uh, 
But uh no part of it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well done, yeah. And so yeah, if there was three lionesses and they played one lioness, um those lionesses would always respond, try and chase that, that individual to those three lionesses, they typically never responded. So they were able to discern the number of individuals calling and what the relative uh, risk to themselves were. And so that was quite a nice output from that study. That was in the Serengeti, some of Craig Packer's work. So I was sitting at a sighting once, Guy. Yep. And some of my guests, uh, the two male lions in the northeastern part of the reserve. And uh, it's the first time we had seen them on the reserve. And they started roaring. And one of my guests videoed them roaring. And he wanted to check if he got the shot, and he played it back, and uh, they heard themselves and ran off the property, never to be seen again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe it comes down to the intelligence of the individual. So folks, just a quick disclaimer here, um, just because you've looped around doesn't ma mean we'll find him again. <laughs> These uh, cats are notorious for disappearing, uh, but hopefully we do find him again. I'm just going to get into the last area where he was last seen. There's a giraffe staring into the reeds there. That giraffe standing there, center of frame, is where we were initially parked. And the leopard is a bit further north than that giraffe. So we're just going to be a little bit uh, silent for the time being. We're just nearing the area where he was last seen. So we're just concentrating on trying to find him again. If, uh, if we're not responding to your questions right now. Mainly about, it's mainly about us finding him again. It's okay. encouragement. Winds died down completely now. The late afternoon. Stand by for a second. Uh, does anybody have bun? Can I use this? See why you wear glasses now, do you know?
question for the two Garrets um, from King of Beasts. What amount of school do you need to complete to become a safari guide? Well, it's recommended that you complete uh, your full school career. <laughs> but yeah, um, after matric, you can, if you want to have a look at Fugaz's website, you'll probably get the most, your best answer there, Field Guiding Association of South Africa. And you'll find all the details necessary there. Um, or you can go the long route, like Gina did, um, studied zoology and what else, Gina? Bot and botany. And then did for Gaza on top of that. After that. After that. Six and a half years with the university. Yeah. But yeah, I'd say it'll give you all the details of what you need to become a guide. Linda van Rooyen, is that? Is that? It's my mum. Yeah. Hi, mum. Um, love that DNA samples of scat can confirm paternity of cubs. Uh, yeah, it is fantastic. It's amazing. It's. Probably the less glamorous part of field research, picking up carnivore poo, but um, we do, it tells us a huge amount. And we now have uh, DNA material from, from over 100 different leopards in the Mala Mala and, and Sabi San game reserves. So it's a very exciting new avenue of, of the research. Is there, in essence, a, a pseudo matriarch within the pride who decides when and where? Um, <laughs> so, guys, do you know it's just trying to get us stuck here? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> you might have to answer one because we bombed down. <laughs> there's, there's some mixed results with regards to that. Um, some of the work that uh, Dr. Philip Stunder. Uh, in Namibia, in Etosha did, um, looking at lion hunting behavior, suggested that they were very coordinated. He actually sort of um, related a, a, a pride or a pride of hunting lions as a sort of similar sort of strategy as you would in, in rugby and with different positions and, 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 and it appeared that lions in that much more open system needed to, to adapt and needed to, to, to implement this, this more coordinated approach. Uh, here in Kruger and in the Serengeti, where they've similarly looked at lion having particular roles, lions don't seem to take um, cognizance of, of wind direction, things like that. Um, and, and this is often why I guess their, their, their success rates are quite low. Um, I guess older females in a pride might be more experienced and, and, and thus. Um, appear to be more successful but but it doesn't stop younger females trying to get involved and often spoiling a hunt because of it or young males for that, for that matter so so th that seems to be somewhat habitat specific is how synchronized or coordinated lion prides are with regards to their, their hunting techniques I guess it also depend a bit, bit on the prey species as well that they're hunting yeah absolutely so, so for bigger prey male lions are, are that much more important things like buffalo male lions are very much more involved just because of their bigger size um greater strength okay we have that position sure um there's a every can help us out of their camera traps i don't know if that will be something you'll be looking at Absolutely, there is. Um, we, we can because we can recognise individual hyenas uh, from the photographs. We can use similar statistical models to estimate number. The, the only problem is, so say, from our six-week survey of of Mala Mala, we might expect to get 150 photographs of leopards. We'll almost certainly get over a thousand photographs of spotted hyenas, and so it's very difficult to wade through that and work out how many individuals there are. And um, we can. Increasingly, you rely on on artificial intelligence, on computers doing it for us. Um, but but often the best way of of, of surveying hyenas, of, of counting hyenas, and, and working out their relative densities in an area, is using call-ups. There's a squirrel alarming here. Maybe it's seen the leopard. Yes, uh, this 
I'm going to try and zoom in on it, but we stopped because, and there's some, that little guy sent to a frame is alarm calling. It's a tree squirrel. Okay, we shot him. Yeah. Gina's just having a look at the ground there to see if you can see any leopard tracks. Maybe the leopard walked by, so you can't see anything there. So, the, so get back to the question, the best way typically to, um, to count hyenas is to do a, a call-up survey. So you would, you would pay the sound typically of a distressed animal, maybe a, a, a calf in distress, a buffalo calf in distress. We'll play a call up and see if that hyena responds and we find another individual hyena play the call up from three kilometers away and we, we work out what the response likelihood is at different distances and then so we know if we put a, a call up at a, a site and we let's just say we, we work out that roughly half of all hyenas respond in a five kilometer radius and we count 10 hyenas at a spot then we know well they're likely 20 hyenas in that sampled area so that's typically the best way of 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 estimating hyena numbers and it's something that we hope to do um at mala mala in the in the in the near future it's, it's on our on our our plans going forward with the reserve so stay tuned to just the episode that's about to come out is where uh, guy and nikki are doing some call-ups and they called myself and Dan Bailey up as well, not only lions and hyenas. So if you want to have a look, just uh, like and subscribe our YouTube channel. It should be coming out either tonight or tomorrow. <laughs> Apparently a very experienced guide would have been able to pick out that that wasn't a real animal. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what Dan was saying. He's like, it sounds a bit weird. It's like, no, it's definitely a warthog. <laughs> Jeanette, how's your goat bleep? Maybe you could call out the Maxon's mail for us. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe we should just send you outside the vehicle again. That yeah, worked last that time. Worked eh? Hold the camera again. <laughs> have him walking behind me. Yeah. Some guy can talk about how much he loves leopards. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So this is a very difficult broken terrain to drive through here. So I don't think we're going to attempt crashing through that bush over there. And um, yeah. Hi, uh, Barbara Russell. Seeing this place brings back wonderful memories. I'm, I'm sure it does. It's uh, I don't get to spend that much time here, but it is truly spectacular. Uh, Linda from California. Is your project Panthera the same one on Zooniverse? Uh, it is. Yes. Um, because of the, the just the, the vast quantity of camera trap images we get, we have millions of camera trap photographs every year. We struggle to, um, to to identify the species in all those photographs ourselves. We just don't have the staff capacity, so we rely on um, on on volunteers. Linda, possibly like yourself, that identify what is captured in the. In the camera trap images, I, I'll, I'll admit it's incredibly addictive. You just want to look at each one and see what what comes next, and then um, and then we have basically algorithms that work out how reliable those classifications are. So if ten people say it's the same animal, so ten people say it's an impala, then it gets pulled off the system as an impala, um, and 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 so on. So it is a, a very effective way for us to to be able to process and analyze our data. It's also a wonderful way for, um, for, for the public to be able to, to really engage and become part of very important research and a, and a huge help to ourselves. Klein, uh, you should certainly... The is, is camera catalog. Camera catalog. And you will find the 
surveys that we run here on Mala Mala as well as many other places, not only on, on leopards but on snow leopards and jaguars, cheetahs, um, small cats, all of those are posted up there and, and those data, we, we need your help, need, need to be processed. Your assistance and others is, is, is vital to the work we do, so thank you very much. Uh, Kimberly Lopez, has there been a female leopard successfully rear three cubs to adulthood? Uh, there have been a few. Um, we know we now have data on about 450 leopards um, from the Mala Mala and, and Sabi Sands game reserves. That's over the 40 odd years that we've been um, documenting uh, reproductive events. And, and, and we know that the sort of litter sizes vary from one to three, and, and cub mortality is very high. So, so only roughly. Maybe 35% of cubs make it to independence, which is normally at about a year and a half old. Um, but there have been a few mothers that have, have got the um, uh, three cubs to independence. There was a very successful female leopard here at, at Mala Mala, known as the Gobazwan female, that was uh, active here for many years. Um, and she, she managed to do that, I, I think maybe two or three. The first litter of four leopard cubs. Um, it has been documented elsewhere in other parts of Africa that leopards can have four cubs and, and up in captivity up to six cubs, but but never in the Sabi Sands. We, the, the most we've ever seen is is, is three. So, so oh. yeah, for those thirsty guides out there, challenge yeah. accepted. Challenge <laughs> accepted. <laughs> you know. This is lap, lap wing. Um, I don't think that's a subjective question whether when leopards or lions loses a cub. Is there any evidence of mourning um, or are they too focused on the task of raising the remaining cubs? Um, I don't know whether that process of them searching for that cub even after, like I say, sometimes they've they've eaten it. If that's some form of mourning, potentially, um, I don't know. Um, often you will see though, they, um, they, they generally when, when a cub is lost, often an entire litter is lost because like I say, it's, off, it's the, the cause of death. Is, 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 is frequently violent um, a, a full litter might be killed by another male leopard or by another predator and and they do they, they start um, they'll, they'll, they'll resume mating very soon after that so within days uh, because they have such low success rates it's important that they do that they resume cycling and, and try to get another litter going as quickly as possible again Jeanette I think let's slowly bumble back um, back towards camp or back towards the animal? Uh, back towards camp, either western or eastern bank, but maybe western bank's got better signal. Mrs. Andromedas, uh, you're, you're correct. Uh, the Nanga female's mother, which was in Yaleti, she did. She raised, um, she, she raised three cubs to, uh, to independence. Um, one of those uh, being Nanga, I think. Yep. Uh, one of them being a male that has. Uh, uh, territorial in the western part of the Sabi Sands, the Indialeti male, and uh, and then the, the last one died, but but after independence. Folks, so we're just gonna slowly drive back towards the Maxims male was last seen, and then we're gonna slowly head back to camp. Let us know if you'd like us to keep on streaming uh, all the way back to camp. Uh, I know Guy and Nikki also have had a very long day out here, they've been setting up camera traps since early this morning. Um, so I'd also like to give them a break and just uh, maybe it's a good time just to say thank you to both of you. Uh, thanks Nikki, you're on screen there and thanks to Guy thanks, um, for joining us and uh, for answering all these questions. We really appreciate the work you're doing here as guides and um, I'm sure everybody out there appreciates um, all the information that you have to give to them. Okay, well, well thank, thank you. So much. Yeah, thank you very much. It's uh, as I say, the, all the data that is collected on this project is, is done by guides. It's, it, it, it would not be possible uh, without the hard work of, of yourselves and, and others. So, Zona, we are, uh, are deeply indebted. So, th so thank you to, to all the guides and to, to the owners and the managers at, at Mala Mala and the other reserves. It's, um, yeah, this is, it's a great privilege to be able to work here and, and, and just to, to be part of this. So thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. Thanks. And thanks to all of you out there who join us, some of you quite religiously. We appreciate your support and we always appreciate your comments on our YouTube channel as well as these live feeds. It's a lot of fun being out here with you and we're just too happy to share this with you. It's an amazing area um, and yeah, we just 
thankful to be out here and thankful that we can share this with you as well. Yeah, so Gina's just pointing out that he was last seen right here. I think we'll just carry on going. Sure. Uh, has anybody answered? There was a there was quite an interesting quite an interesting question from Sadiq Toama. Uh, it was Safari game. Um, are you using any facial recognition tools or other artificial intelligence tech? Um, like those on uh, AWS to help with analysis. Um, we certainly do. We, we've developed a, a machine classifier now to to complement the work being done by Zooniverse and Camera Catalog. So this uses um, uh, uh, yeah uses machine learning to basically be able to identify now what what species um, is captured by. Uh, the camera trap, it's, it's, it's remarkably effective, um, probably 90% of the time we, the, the computer gets it right. Uh, um, there isn't yet any AI applications which are distinguishing individual leopards. Um, we're, we're, we're working on that, on developing that, but there are pattern recognition. Run it through and see how similar it is to other images but um but i have no doubt within um the next few months we will probably have that we'll have that available to us as well um this i know with um things like whales through sonar they they can identify individual whales uh, from their calls and so hopefully yeah we'll be able to use similar applications for leopards soon Thanks, Arjuna. It was uh, nice to make contact. Take care in Sri Lanka. Have to come I visit think, you sometime. Yeah, I think Arjuna is based in Australia now, but he okay. used to live in Sri Lanka. If I stand to be corrected, but I think that's the case. Uh, Barbara Russell, I'll ask the guides, is this near the Piccadilly Females Territory? I think not too far. So she's a bit further. We're on the right side of the river. Uh, she's on the eastern bank, but she's further north of us. Uh, she's right in front of Mala Mala Main Camp. So currently on the eastern side of the river, this is actually more the Accipiter Males territory. And then female wise, we see the island female, not all that often right here, but I'd, I'd say this is on the fringes of her territory. Gina, you look like you want to say something. Now this area strangely is a little bit... That's a dead patch. Yeah, a bit of a... <laughs> so I'm just going to... Yeah, it's weird because it's amazing big trees here. Uh, when I first arrived here, I thought this is where I'm going to find a leopard hanging off one, or lying on one of these branches of these big trees here. But <laughs> we don't actually see all that many leopards no, in, this exactly little, in this little stretch of road here. Recently we saw the Plark Rock female in this area. Yeah, She's and uh, nomadic at the moment, kind of exploring. Recently got independent from her mom, the Kovani female. So maybe she's looking and eyeing out this, this little spot. It's really quite nice to have a leopard in here. Gina was with a Plark Rock female just the other day watching her hunt monkeys. Yeah, pretty incredible which, really. Which you can view on our YouTube channel. Was that in this area? I know, we found her here that morning and then in the afternoon she was quite close to main camp. Yeah. Now there's, there's a question here about how is new technology helping against uh, poaching? Um, so there are different types of cameras, the ones that we, we showed you here, these are for surveying animals, they have a white flash uh, that goes off and so we can, we can identify the individual. There's other types of cameras that we've developed. Um, Termed our poacher cam. This is a, it's infrared and it's a, it, it, it works on a wireless network, the, the GSM or cellular net network. And we've developed an algorithm which, which recognizes a, a, a person. And so then you would put these up cryptically. And if someone walks past the camera, uh, it takes a photograph, they aren't aware of it. And it sends that thumbnail 
via the, the cellular network to whoever uh, is responsible for, for um, alerts and then you can you can respond to that um, poaching incident in real time so it gives you a much better chance of being able to get in front of a poaching in incident and prevent any animal from being killed so that's a that's one way how technology is being used to to combat poaching so if you feel like you need to get involved or if you have the feel the need to get involved rather and um, Feel free to visit malamala.com and donate. Uh, some of those monies will go, go to those exact cameras that um, Guy is talking about. And if you wish to donate some money towards the research that Guy is doing on, this, on the property here and elsewhere, please feel free to go to panthera.org. Judah, thank you very much. I'll, I'll get your contact details from the guides and uh, it'll be great to meet your brother in Sri Lanka. Thank you. Andromedus, uh, need less skittish males. I would guess that the maximum male in maybe six months to a year would probably become one of these, uh, the, the typical mala mala, very chilled, relaxed individuals. It just takes a bit of time for them to get, get habituated, but but I, I, I think he's got the potential to, to, to be become as relaxed as any other leopard here. His, his, his home range is in a core part of Mala Mala and so he's being viewed often and, and slowly but surely over time he'll realize that the vehicles don't, don't pose a threat. Today he is looking quite relaxed with us around him, which is a good sign. There's an elephant just ahead of us here and he's standing underneath a a okay. torchwood and uh, these elephants have been feeding a lot of the torchwood fruits Gareth, I just want to say that's the one I spotted earlier uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah, but well, just, well done Yeah, thanks yeah. <laughs> Did you see the torchwood behind it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a torchwood <laughs> Yeah, there you go So that's the one that Guy spotted earlier <laughs> Although to me it looks a bit different, Guy <laughs> You can see how the grass is flat. <laughs> it's just making sure that we saw him there. It's a young bull. You can see he's feeling around at his trunk. What he's looking for is these fruits from this large tree to the left of him. Called it Torchwood. Next to ten, what do you think of the lion population in the Ethiopian forests? That would be, I guess, the Herena forest. Um, I'm afraid I don't know much about it. I know there was a, a mission recently to go camera trap that area to look for the lions. I, I don't know what the results were. Um, I do know that is where black leopards occur. So they have melanistic leopards in the in the same Herena forest. And uh, a colleague of mine, Chris Kelly um, from Wildlife Act, he took a, a beautiful photograph, a handheld photograph of, of one of these melanistic leopards. And it's one of the few from Africa handheld pics that we have. So. So maybe Google that and you, you'll get to see what, what they look like. They are truly spectacular. A bush or forest elephant? This is a, this is a, a savannah elephant, a, a bush elephant. Yeah, there's a lot of comments here 
This is G, the Gina Tim. Why you jump like that when the elephant trumpeted? Did I jump? Yeah. Must be <laughs> self conscious. <laughs> He's making those comments. Rangers back at camp. It's pretty much everyone. Yeah. Gnat? Gnat, I must say you are very photogenic from this angle. <laughs> <laughs> I did not say that either. <laughs> yep, Kabini India does have melanistic leopards. Um, uh, many parts of 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 uh, of and uh, northern india um like i said malaysia thailand um many of those areas uh that like nepal um the, the, the vast majority of the cats are, are melanistic um wherever there's sort of dense evergreen forest uh that that recessive gene seems to come out and um i assume just because the the dark cats are that much better suited to a forested environment. So, guy, have you heard about a uh, strawberry leopard? I I have, but I'm going to pass this one over to Nikki because she it's I'm uh, not even going to pronounce it right. Arith Arithrism. No, no, Luke. Uh, what's it called? <laughs> Give me another clue. <laughs> <laughs> Can we cut? <laughs> Take two. I, I have heard of it. I have um, I think I've seen a few pictures. I, I don't know much about it, but I would assume it's a, it could be a, a recessive gene that comes out in some cats with that slightly different color pigment. And I think it's got a slightly more kind of strawberry hmm. aptly named. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it's been commonly documented for whatever reason, but it seems to come out every now and again. Yes, you leave. He might, he might give another head shake as you drive off. Just, uh, just warning you, Gina, so don't jump again. Yeah. <laughs> be composed. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know if you want some help. Give you a blessing. Yeah. Gina, there's a lot of support coming through for you here. Yeah? Most people saying it's no problem to be scared of elephants. <laughs> big, they can be nasty. <laughs> and that the rest of us shouldn't make fun of you. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. <laughs> you get to... Uh, get yeah, yeah. That would be quite nice. Let's see if it doesn't. <laughs> Check if your camera's awake. <laughs> <laughs> Did you switch them off? Yeah. If you'll find out. where we had breakfast. Just up here, we set up a camera trap station this morning. The guy was saying we might just get flashed by the cameras as we drive past. Let's get into that the time of night and the cameras might start flashing. Just to get some nice color on the leopard's coat so you can get those IDs as they walk past. So just up here is where the station is and we'll just see if we get a flash. Maybe Gareth will get a fright this time. Yeah. I'll be sure. I'll, I'll be sure that I'm smiling. <laughs> the camera there. Uh, no, it's, it did flash us, Gina, but you looked the wrong way. Oh, there's one. Oh, there we go, I got it flashing. Went off but no flash, it's still uh, light enough. Okay. So. Both working though, which is a good sign. So we did switch them on. Yeah. yeah.
Folks, uh, so we are coming near the end of our transmission now. Um, and I'd just like to say a final thank you and a goodbye from all of us. So, Guy, thanks a lot. You're welcome to be in charge of the comments anytime. <laughs> thanks everyone for your questions and your support. Much appreciated. Enjoy it. Thank you. Gina, thanks for driving us safely. Thanks everybody. <laughs> I wasn't scared of the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, from myself, Gareth, look forward to our next live stream. And we'll see you shortly, hopefully. And again to Nadav, thanks again, study hard.